Matthew 11, verse 28. It says this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come on, let's pray. Father, we're grateful, we're thankful for this moment, for this time, this space that we share together. Lord, thank you for this, this first Sunday of 2024. God, we're, we're excited. We're expecting. But God, we don't just want this to be a year of what we're expecting. God, we want this to be a year of what we're executing. So will you, Lord, allow us and help us to drop the habits we don't need to pick up the healthy habits, Lord, to become who you've called us to become. Jesus, we love you and we honor you. And as your servants in this room, we say this, speak, Lord because we're listening. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Come on, come on. Everybody said? Amen. 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 You may be seated. Family, there was a time uh, where I was not a fan of department store dressing rooms. I get it. It's a weird way to begin a sermon, I understand. But I just didn't see the logic of taking the time to try on clothes inside of a store when I could just simply do that at home. So for the longest, I would not use dressing rooms. And listen, that was fine. That was okay for a little while until I realized that the clothes that I would bring home to try on and they didn't fit, I would never return them. So I would pick up these clothes, try them on at the house. They wouldn't fit. And then I'm walking by and they still sit in there on the dresser or wherever it is. And I'm like, yo, not only am I not getting the clothes that I need, I'm also losing money by not exchanging the items. Can I tell you that we are losing our souls because there are some habits that we've picked up that we need to exchange. That in the course of living life and being all the things that we need to be, we've picked up some habits that are simply not vital for the soul. And these habits that we've picked up, not only are they not vital, but they're toxic. And the reality is it should be no surprise that we're down. It should be no surprise that we're dealing with anxiety. It should be no surprise that we're dealing with depression. It should be no surprise that our soul, that we feel heavy, it's because we've picked up some things that are not good for the soul. And you know, here we are, we're in a new year. And oftentimes at the end of a year before we cross over to a new year, we kind of see this everywhere. New year, new me. Anybody ever said it? I know I have. And it's this idea that when I cross over to the new year, that I'm all of a sudden going to become a new me. But the reality is, family, just because we cross over into a new year doesn't mean that it's going to be a new me if the approach is the same. And so the reality is we need to change that from new year, new me to new year, new approach. Because if we step into a new year and the new approach is the same on January 1st, then guess what? When we get to December 31st, we're going to sit here and say, it was a new year, but here I am looking at the same me. Which is not a problem when we understand this, that God can do a new thing in the same you. But what hinges on that is the approach has to change. The approach has to be different. And so what the Lord has given us as an opportunity, is to look at what habits have we picked up that are not healthy for the soul and to lay them down and exchange it for habits that are healthy for the soul. And so if you're taking notes today, uh, you can entitle today's conversation, Soul Care. Soul Care. And now to give a little context to the text, the Jewish listeners of Jesus in this moment they, they are intrigued. They are enlightened. This is, this is a new message that they're hearing because his message, Jesus' message, is vastly different from the message of the religious leaders 
of the day. The religious leaders of the day, they would place all of these burdens and hurdles on people, burdens that they say would be necessary to carry out in order to be approved and accepted by God. And so here comes Jesus saying, no, 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 I have a different way. I have a better way. I have a way that leads to rest for your soul, but also a connection to the Father. And listen, we're living in a similar scenario today. We're living in a world that places all these expectations and requirements on us in order to be making it, right? Yo, you got to do this. If you're not doing this, you're not making it. If you don't have 19 streams of income, are you really getting it? And here you are over here trying to sell snacks at your kid's school because you need another stream. (laughs) And so all these things that the world tells us we need to be doing, we're trying to do. And it's unhealthy for us. They're putting all these requirements on. Let's look at church. It says, listen, if you... If you're not praying 24 hours a day, don't eat, don't sleep, don't drink, don't do nothing, you're not a real Christian. If if you don't miss it sometimes, you're not a real Christian. All these things that we'll try to put, because you you ain't come to church in a suit because you didn't show, whatever. You're you're not, you're not, whatever. All these different requirements that the world, that we try to put on us that says, well, this determines if you're making it or not. And so what happens is, we, we try to do it because the peer pressure, the pressure around us, we, we may be able to say no for a moment, but before you know it, it starts to creep in. And now we find ourselves doing things that we know are unhealthy because, well, we, we want to make it. And so as a result of that, our souls are screaming. Our souls are, are hurting. Our souls are not in a good place. And can I tell you, we have to be aware of this because... Scripture says, what does it profit a man to gain the world but lose his soul? So you know what that means? There are things that we can gain that are actually good. But guess what? Just because they're good, they may not be good for you. So it's good that they got that, but it's not good for me. So I tried to reach that and attain that, and then I did. But guess what I lost in the process? My soul. So then we have to ask the question, Did I really gain? I didn't. I lost. And this is important because we say, God, this is a year of building. This is building season. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, I will build my church. And when he says church, he's not talking about buildings and structures and organizations, but he's talking about people. He's talking about singles. He's talking about uh, marriage. He's, He's talking about families. He's talking about men. He's talking about women. He's building his people. And it's important that if we're going to build, we have to build effectively. And in order to do that, we have to care about and analyze and look at the condition of our soul and then do the, good, the right work. Because if we do all these things but our soul is out of place, then family, we're living out of order. Because we did it, we walked it, but we lost our soul in the process. And so today is a chance to sit down. You know, it's like when you, if you hear you know, some knocking noise in your car, what do you do? You take it into the shop, say, yo, let's run a diagnostic test. Now, you should take it. Don't, don't just keep riding and, and you hear the knocking. Don't do that. <laughs> but you take it in and you let them run some tests on the car to pinpoint what the issue is so that then they can offer the solution. So here we are, we're sitting down and we're saying, Lord, we want to identify what are the, the toxins, the, the, the burdens that we have been carrying that we've picked up maybe five years ago? And here we are. We're still carrying it. We're in a new year. We say we want something new, but God, we got to do something new. So let's identify what those are. We're going to put those down and exchange them for what Jesus actually wants us to carry. And look at what the psalmist says in Psalm 42, verse 5. It says this, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? So he's asking the question, so what's wrong with you? What is it that's got you down? What is it that has you in this place? What is it that has you going through, feeling what you're feeling, dealing with the anxiety and depression and all the things? What is it? Why are you in turmoil? And so we're going to identify those habits and we're going to drop them. And here's the first habit that we 
are going to identify today is unforgiveness. That many of us, we've been carrying unforgiveness for years. And it is ruining our soul. We just finished the 2023 Christmas season, our holiday season, going back to Thanksgiving. And what many of us experienced were these moments where we, we left tables and rooms where we sat down and we ate a meal and, and, we, and we, we smiled and we laughed with people who we have not forgiven. And every fake smile, every fake laugh, you know what was happening? The root of unforgiveness was growing deeper and deeper. And so instead of leaving that moment feeling joy and excitement, we left that moment feeling sad and and feeling sorrow and feeling hurt and pain and being reminded of what we've been walking with and carrying because we have chosen to hold on to unforgiveness. But listen, family, this is not how God wants us to live. This is not how we've been called to live. Look at Matthew 6, 14 through 15. Jesus says this, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, we can hear this, read this, and ask the question, so wait a minute. So Jesus, I thought forgiveness was this free gift that we experience through grace, that he died for past, for current past and future sins. So he's saying that he won't forgive us? No, that's not what's saying here. This, this verse is not saying, well, your salvation depends on this, because if it did, you know what that means? That means salvation depends on works. But salvation is not about our work, but it's about Jesus' work. So that's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is when you hold on to unforgiveness, you're not in the state to actually receive the forgiveness that he's brought to us. So in order for us to receive the forgiveness that Jesus has brought to us, we actually have to release unforgiveness that we've been harboring to others. So in other words, it's saying this, forgiving people, forgive people. So because we have been forgiven It is on us now to forgive others because the Lord is saying, well, wait a minute. Who are you to think that you can withhold unforgiveness when I sat up there on that cross? I didn't do any of those things, but yet I died for the sins of the world. So, yes, I know they treated you wrong. Yes, I know they hurt you. Yes, I know that they spread all types of rumors about you. But listen, I took on the sins of the world, and I did it out of my love for you. So now because of that, you have to do the same. Now we can hear this and say, well, wait a minute. You're saying you're blaming the victim? You're blaming the person who's been hurt by saying, oh, I'm the one who has to forgive? No, they hurt me. And listen, they did. And you're justified, right? We heard this, we can hear the story and say, you know what? You have a right to feel the way you feel. But Jesus is saying, no, you need to forgive them. This is not about victim shaming. This is not about saying that it's on you. It's not about saying that it's your fault. It's not about saying that you welcome into your life what they did to you. It's not saying that at all. It's saying, I recognize the grace that has been given to me and understanding that I keep myself in prison when I hold on to unforgiveness. Because now that pain, that hurt that they made you feel, it's becoming the thing that will run your life for the next 50 years. That every decision you make, consciously and subconsciously, is going to flow through the filter of the unforgiveness that you're holding on to. You won't be able to dream. You won't actually be able to pray. You won't really be able to worship. There's going to feel like this heaviness that's on your life because of unforgiveness. It'll cause you to not even be able to celebrate others. Because maybe what you should be celebrating in a moment is reminding you of hurt that someone else brought to you. Oh, you got engaged? Well, watch out. Because I was engaged once. 
oh, you got that job? Well, guess what? I was also once the up and, and coming on the job. And so now we can't even celebrate with people and we're in prison because we're holding on to unforgiveness. So choosing to forgive is not even so much about the person more than it is about you. Because for some people, they don't even know that they hurt you. That's how they can see you. You think like, you think, we think that they're just being dismissive, showing up and smiling in my face like they don't even know what they did. Can I tell you they don't? <laughs> Sometimes they don't. And so then we showing up, we mad, and they trying to figure out what's wrong with so-and-so. But we got to be able to release and get out of the prison that unforgiveness is. So, and in other cases, yeah, people knew. Oh, yeah, they knew, they knew for sure what they did. But guess what? Here's what I'm saying. We still got to forgive them. But forgive does not mean forget. So you can remember what they did, but you can still forgive them. Yo, we not cool like that no more. I, 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 I forgive you, I, I, and I remember, right? And so because of that, ah, you, you cool over there. You stay over there. Pray God blesses you. Awesome. God do that in their life. But, but no, no, no. It's different now. And that's okay. But you, we still have to forgive so we're not held in prison by unforgiveness. What else? Comparison. Look at James 3, verse 14. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Look, James says, listen, choosing to hold on to forgiveness, basic, excuse me, to comparison, choosing to live that way, James is saying that, that is the, the furthest thing from God. In fact, look what James says. He says, listen, that, that doesn't come from heaven, but it's earthly. It's unspiritual. Then James just flat out gets to the point, listen, it's demonic. So we have to be careful and don't fall to the trap of comparison because everything around us is yelling at us to take the bait and step into comparison. It's easy looked at through someone gets a new house, someone gets a new car. All of a sudden, you got to get a new car. All of a sudden, you feel like, you know what, it's, it's, it's time to move. We need to upgrade. And here you are sitting on a 2.75, and you're going to go get a 7.6. What you doing? <laughs> He's like, no, you need to sit down. It's not your time, baby. Just hold on. Let that equity go up a little bit and just, just ride the course. It's not all oh, my realists in the room like, hold on. No, it is sell, sell, sell. <laughs> <laughs> But we, but we get caught up into this game of comparison, and it's, it's a trap. Comparison is a, a thief of joy. Have you ever met someone who is constantly comparing something? They're never happy. They're never satisfied. It's never enough. Every time you meet them, like, yo, listen, this is what I'm on next. And it's probably because of what they saw someone else do. And social media is one of the things that really pushes this type of, of living in front of us. And that is such a dangerous game to play. You know why? Because what happens is we compare our reality to a false reality. We compare it to something that's doctored up. We compare it to something that's ran through a filter. Can I tell you, if you see me post anything on social media, please know this. It's gone through a filter. Oh, yeah, that thing ain't been doctored up. And I spent some time on that. Like, listen, what's going to bring this out? What's going to bring that out? That room was a little dark. Can you get a little lighter on that? It's ran through a filter, baby. I got Lightroom on my phone right now. It's going to go through a filter. And, and, and then I look at everybody. Excuse me. I don't look at anyone else except me in the picture. Do I look good? <laughs> and so then here we are comparing ourselves to a false reality. Comparing ourselves to what has gone through a filter. And now we're dealing with anxiety and depression and all these things. Instead of thanking God for what we do have, we are asking God, like, how come I don't have this? How come I, ha I don't have that? And God says, because they don't even have that. <laughs> because it's not real. 
And so we have to make sure we avoid the trap of comparison. What else? Anger. Many of us, we, the way many of us deal with anger is to not deal with it at all. We just simply pretend that it's not there. Pretend that it doesn't exist. And this is a dangerous game because ultimately, every time we try to just suppress it, it's just building up this deep well that one day and in one moment is going to explode and overflow. And oftentimes it's on someone who had no idea what was coming. And when it happens, family, it has the potential to derail our destiny because now we're framing everything of our life through the lens of anger. It's the person that you see, that if you've seen this person, they just, it, they just look hard. Their face look hard. They, they look tired. They look worn out. It's because of this suppression of anger in which they've been living their life through. And maybe some of us, the reason why we suppress anger, we think that it's a noble thing that we're doing. Because we're like, yo, to be angry is to sin. And so we think it's noble and wise to say, well, no, I'm just going to suppress what I feel. But let, let me challenge our thinking if that's what we think. Look at Ephesians 4.26. It says, Paul says here in his letter to the church in Ephesus, he says, in your anger, do not sin. So right here, Paul's saying, wait a minute, look at this. So in your anger, do not sin. So Paul is clearly showing that to feel the emotion of anger is not sin. Because he's telling the the saints here, listen, in your anger, don't sin. So being angry about something and feeling that emotion is not sin, family, but it's how we process that and deal with that that can ultimately lead to sin. So that's why we have to have healthy ways to process anger. And it's never to just be quiet about what you feel. And men, we, would, we deal with this a lot. Because if a, if a man is expressing what he may be going through, it's called complaining. And you're not be a, being a man talking about all the problems you deal with. And you just need to step up to the plate. But that's not it. That is unhealthy way for a man to think. And it's unhealthy for us for, for that to be placed on us. Instead, it's to figure out ways to deal with that. You know, if there are emotions and things that I'm dealing with, I get up and I go to the gym. In some moments, I'm stronger than others, which means that thing must have got on my nerve. (laughs) But it's a way to process that out. There are people, and this is is for all of us. I'm not just talking directly to the men. But it's for all of us to to, to have that trusted voice and and that that person that we can go to that's a prayer partner perhaps. And like, yo, here's what I'm I'm dealing with. And here's what I'm struggling with. And get it off. And and you'll feel good. and, and, And it'll still be true. But you'll feel better. Versus continually to suppress that to one day you explode. You know, there was something that I was upset about, I guess about five years ago now, or going on six years. And I remember I was driving around, and I was mad about something. I mean, I know what it is. I'm just not going to say it. (laughs) But I was mad about this thing. So you know know what I did? I, I was yelling in my car. I was riding around in that forerunner, and I was just yelling. And I was even calling out the names of people, of the, peop- of the person that I was upset with. And I felt so good after that. And really what it was was just a real way for me to express that I was feeling that. Because I felt bad that I was angry with them. I felt bad that I'm like, how could you let yourself feel like this towards that person? And just the simple thing of me saying, Lord, I am upset with so-and-so. And it allowed me to forgive them. And, you know, I forgave them without having to, because, I mean, they did it to me, so I didn't have to go to them and be like, hey, I need you to, you know. They, they were the ones who wronged me, but because of what I was feeling, I just said, Lord, I, re- I release that, and I let that go. And I was able to no longer harbor what I was feeling towards them in that moment. And so that's what Paul is saying. Well, how you deal with that anger determines if it becomes sin or not. Look at what Gary Chapman says. He says this, the challenge is not don't get angry. The challenge is not to sin when we are angry. So we got to have the right system and process in dealing with anger. Here's the last thing I want to talk about in regards to what we need to place down is worry. You know, there are people who benefit from us 
worrying. There are podcasters and influencers and, and uh, news outlets and, and all these different things that benefit us from worrying. Oh, my goodness. What is 2024 going to bring? Oh, my goodness, the uncertainty. You better store it up now. You better get ready now. 2024 is a year of the unknown. Oh, my goodness, Netflix just released this movie. You remember last time they released a movie. You got a Tesla, too, don't you? You better watch out, watch out. (laughs) Oh, no, what are we in for? What are we in for? And so what happens, it causes us to live that way. And so we are looking for something around the corner. And I'm not talking to you from something that I've mastered. I'm talking to you from something that I'm praying through myself. That, Lord, I don't want to live through this lens of what could happen next. I don't want to live through this lens of expecting it to go wrong. I don't want to live in a place of worry. And look what he says in Matthew 6, 27. Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? In other words, what is it going to do? Is it fruitful? Is it beneficial? Is it going to change the reality of what you're facing? And I'm not saying that we have to ignore the reality so that we don't worry. But listen, it's, we can deal with it. And says, listen, this is not about what I can control because that's nothing. But this is all about trusting God who is in control. And hear me, worry leaves when we accept that we are not in control, but God is. That's, that's where worry begins. Worry begins because we live in this false reality that we're in control. And 2020 revealed that. Because you couldn't go outside when you wanted to. You couldn't go to the mall when you wanted to. You couldn't go to the gym when you wanted to. You couldn't go eat inside the restaurant when you wanted to. And so it was this year of understanding and, and being shown that we're not in control. But here's the thing. We've never been. And so God says we can escape the toxicity of worry when we understand that we are not in control. So those are the habits that we need to drop up. What do we need to pick up? What exchange do we need to make if we're going to begin this year with a new approach? Here's the first habit. We need to pick up the right relationships. So to combat unforgiveness, we need to start with right relationships. Because understand this, we can't get life right if we get relationships wrong. If we want to do life right, if we want to live life right, we have to live with the right relationships. Because oftentimes the things that we deal with that are detrimental to our soul are a direct correlation to having the wrong relationships. Because of the nature of the world that we live in, social media, you know, we're Facebook friends. We follow each other on Instagram. We added you on uh, Snapchat, whatever it is. So we think because of that, it's caused us to cheapen what friend actually means. And so now everyone is our friend. We friends with everybody. But no, we're not friends with everyone. In fact, we don't have the capacity to truly live up to the true definition of what a friend is, a friend that sticks closer than a brother with a whole bunch of people. So 40 friends, you can't do that. That's 40 people, you know their names. That's not 40 friends. But the problem comes when we have an expectation from somebody that is really an associate or an acquaintance, and we say that they're a friend and we have an expectation that we place an expectation of friendship on them, and then when they can't deliver that, you know what happens? We get upset, and now we're holding on to unforgiveness. But listen, we have to look at ourselves and take the responsibility because we use that label friend too loosely, and they weren't a friend. They're someone that we know. They're someone that we worked with. They're someone that they, we have a mutual connection to someone else. But that so-and-so friend, and I'm their friend, but we are not friends. And that sounds harsh, and that sounds tough, but no, family, is actually stewardship. It's stewarding my mind, my capacity, my time, my soul well to understand who I need to be connected to. Proverbs 13, 20, the one who walks with the wise will become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. So you're saying, well, what do we do then? 
People who I know, like, ooh, I've, I've called them a friend, but they're not a friend, so what do I do now? Do I just dismiss them and act like they don't exist? No, of course not. But what you do, you have to live with the right proximity now. Like, yo, hey, you know, it's me. It's not you. That sounds bad. <laughs> but, but, you know, we cool. I'm going to text you on your birthday. Yo, happy birthday, you know. Oh, I'm going to text you Merry Christmas. I'm going to text you at all, you know, all the moments. But, yeah, yo, we can't kick it anymore. I see you over there. I see what God's doing in your life. And, you know, if I run into you at Bridge Street, cool, what's up? We'll, we'll hope everything's going well. And that's not trying to be rude or distant, but it's understanding that us being in close proximity is toxic for my life. And I have to steward my soul in the right way. And we'll dig more into that next month. We're starting a collection on uh, February 4th, I believe, is that first Sunday. And it's called uh, Together. And we're going to be talking about relationships with, with people, uh, dating, uh, marriage, and, and family. And so that first week, we're talking about more about what uh, I just kind of got into now. And so looking forward to that. Here's the next thing we need to pick up. We need to pick up God-defined identity so that we don't fall into the trap of comparison. Galatians 6, 4. But each one must carefully scrutinize his own work, examine his actions, attitudes, and behavior. And then he can have the personal satisfaction and inner joy of doing something commendable without comparing himself to another. And I love that part, that he can have the personal satisfaction and inner joy of doing something commendable without comparing himself to another. In other words, it's living in a way that I can celebrate what's happening in my life. And not tear it down when I look to the left and see what God is doing in someone else's life. Because oftentimes for many of us, what happens is we will miss the miracle that God has done in our life because we're looking at someone else. But this is saying, no, we need to live in such a way that we can look at our life, look at where we are, and feel the inner joy and understand that this has God's hand on it. It has God's blessing on it. It has God's approval on it. That this is because of him. And so the issue comes when we begin to look to the left and right. You know, I see this a lot with ministry. And, you know, I go to conferences or talk to, you know, pastors. And it's like, yeah, man, how's the church doing? Man, you want to ask me how I'm doing? <laughs> they go, how's the church doing? I was like, yeah, it's going well. And then they say, well, you know, man, we just, you know, we're at our 17th service. I'm being a little facetious here, you know. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, parking lot's crazy. Yeah, this is just you know, it's, it's something, man. Gosh, it's just, it's, it's, I'm just humbled, you know. And then I'm just sitting there like, Lord. So, man, what about you guys, man? What you running? I'm like, look, I'm just running trying to make 100 because 99 and a half won't do. <laughs> if you grew up in church, you got it. But not for real. It's just, I'm like, ah, we're just trying to do what God puts in front of us. And whatever that is, that's what it is. I'm just trying to be obedient to what he says to do. But here's the problem. If I take and hear what God is doing in some city 1,500 miles away with a different context and different understanding and stuff that I don't even know about, or even if that's down the street, and I compare it to whatever God is doing here, and then all of a sudden I feel like what God is doing here is not enough, then I'm cheapening what God has done. I'm missing the miraculous that's taking place. I'm missing the souls that's been changed. I'm missing the, the transformation that's taking place, the marriages that's been healed, the people that have now are now walking in freedom because I'm looking over at something else. So we have to look at what we have and say, yo, God is doing a good thing. And understand this, that we need to live life in the context of who God says we are, not who others say we are. And when you get that, you can walk around and know this, I'm complete in him, that I'm alive in Christ, that I'm free from sin and death. I have the mind of Christ, that God supplies everything I need, that I can do all things through Christ Jesus, that I'm God's masterpiece, that I'm chosen, that I'm above and not beneath, that I'm forgiven of all my sins, that I'm redeemed, that I am healed by the work of Jesus, that I'm greatly loved by God, for it is not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. So how can I cheapen the Christ who lives in me, family? We don't have to compare ourselves. So we need to walk with a God identity because he is the one who designed us. And Micah, come help me land this plane, please. Here's what else. 
We need to live with a crucified life to deal with anger or whatever emotion that may be. Galatians 5.24 says, Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So what Paul is saying to this letter, in this letter here, he is saying, listen, you belong to Christ. So now the flesh has been crucified. crucified. So you're no longer subjective to the flesh. So just because your flesh says this is a passion, just because your flesh says this is a desire, that doesn't mean that's who you are. That doesn't mean that you have to respond to it. Through every temptation, the Lord has made a way of escape. And just like to feel anger is not a sin, neither is feeling temptation is a sin. And Matthew, from Matthew 3 to Matthew 4, we see where Jesus was led in the wilderness by the Spirit, and then Satan came to try to tempt him. So being tempted is not a sin, but it's what happens after that moment that leads to if it ever becomes sin. So I say that to say this, family, if you're tempted to respond a certain way in the moment, that temptation is not a sin. But we do the same thing of, that Jesus did in Matthew 4. He understood who he was because at the end of Matthew 3, he had just had this moment where the sky opened up and the Lord, the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am pleased in. And so now he did not fall victim to the voice of the enemy that was telling him, you're this and you're that. And if you do this, I'll give you that. So it's the same way with our emotions. They will tell us we feel this way. Tell us we feel that way. You need to respond this way. No, we, re- we respond the same way that Jesus did with the word of God. And it keeps us from falling victim to the emotions that we feel. So we have to say this, that I'm not going to allow what I feel to direct my life. Instead, I will allow Christ, who I belong to, to guide my life. So what about worry? Well, instead of worry, family, here's the last one. We're going to live with an eternal perspective. Matthew 6, 27, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? He's saying, what is that going to do? What is that going to accomplish? And I love I love the, 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 the question that comes before this in Matthew 6, 26, where Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And here's the question I love. Are you not much more valuable than they? Come on. Come on now. Are you not much more valuable? How much more does he love you? How much more will he clothe you? That the birds of the air, they don't get up in the morning and wonder and have concern about what they will eat, but yet they eat. And so scripture is saying, how much more does God, your heavenly father, love you? Can I tell you the angels marvel? They ask this question, who is man that God is so mindful of them? Not only that, he calls us friend. So yes, he takes care of the birds. He closed the lilies of the field. How much more will he provide for you? So listen, I don't know what 2024 holds, but can I tell you, I know who holds it. And it sounds a little cliche. It sounds a little elementary, but it's still true. So I don't know what happens in the next moment. I don't know what happens tomorrow or next week, but I know who holds the future. So I'm not going to live bogged down by worry, but instead I'm going to step into every promise that God has laid out for me. And I'm not going to allow worry or fear to guide my life, but instead the voice in the word of God. So we have to change our perspective because some of us, we've been living a low life when we should be living a high life. You say, what do you mean? Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on things above, but not on earthly things. What low things do you need to get your mind off of this year? What earthly things have your mind been bogged down with? The Lord is saying, it's time to elevate your thinking. In the same way you see a house renovated, he says, listen, let me renovate your mind. Let me come into your mind and tear down some walls of depression, walls of anxiety, walls of fear. And let me build up some walls of hope, some walls of faith, some walls of freedom, some walls of transformation. Let me renew your mind so that we can be 
who God has called us to be. And here it is, going back to our opening text, Matthew 11. Here's how we do this. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is like, here's what Jesus is saying to all of us today. He's saying in 2024, come to me. That we have gone everywhere else. We've gone to our friend group and that's good. We need that. We need a friend who sticks closer to a brother. We've gone to all, but Jesus says, no, come to me. Because listen, the world will scream, do this and do that. But Jesus is just saying, come. And you know what it is? It's an invitation to trust him. It's an invitation to worship. It's an invitation to commune with him, to fellowship with him. He says, if your soul is tired, come to me so I can give you rest for your soul. And then he says to take. He says to take what I'm offering. He says to come, become my disciple, to live in the peace of God. A disciple is someone who follows after a teacher. And so Jesus, he's a rabbi, which means he's our teacher and we are his disciple. And in those days, a, a disciple will walk close to their rabbi so much so that the dust of their feet will kick up in their face. So Jesus is saying, walk with me to get so, so to the point that the dust will follow up in your face. Why? Because we want to be with you. We want to become like you and we want to do what you did. But that only comes comes when we take what he's offering. And then he says, learn. Learn from me, which means to live in the, this process. It's a process. It's a, it's a word called sanctification, which simply means a process. It's the process, the journey of becoming. So that means, guess what? On day one, it's a struggle. On day two, it's a struggle. On day 30, it's a struggle. But then some stars change it on day 31. Your thinking gets a little different on day 32. And on day 33, you realize you didn't respond the same way that you responded on day one. It's this process of change and transformation that the Lord is taking you through. So he simply says, learn. So come to me. Take what I'm offering and learn from me. Would you pray?